reflect things that you have done in, in your lab work. So we talked about the procurement process, which was buying things. Now we're talking about the fulfillment process, which is selling things. So kind of the, the inverse of that. And uh, the outline of, of how we're going to cover this, we'll talk about the organizational levels that are relevant to us in fulfillment and in what way they are relevant. We'll talk about the master data related to fulfillment. Uh, we'll talk about some concepts that are important to us in fulfillment. And then we'll work through the fulfillment process in detail. This should look familiar in that it's the same structure uh, that we employed for talking about the procurement process and we'll kind of continue to follow this pattern in, in chapters yet to come. So the basic elements of the fulfillment process are, as, as you see illustrated here, this is often called the order to cash process or often even more abbreviated as a O to C with the idea being that what starts the process is getting an order from the customer and then what ends the process is our receiving payment uh, for that particular process. So this is something that certainly we hope to do a lot of in our organization. We receive the customer purchase order. Um, we create a sales order in our system for that. Uh, we prepare the shipment, which uh, typically may involve picking and packing the items. We send the shipment on its way. Uh, we create and send an invoice, and then we receive payment. As an aside, and I don't think this was talked about in your reading necessarily, as you think about all of these different steps right here, which one do you think is the one that gets the most attention in a lot of organizations in terms of trying to progressively do better? Which, so which, uh, you're saying this step right here, creating a sales order? I don't know who said that. this step right here and why do, why do you say that and and that's reflective of what I was thinking as well um, you know you see right here this idea there there's kind of this little gap right here which of course in reality may illustrate the the passage of time and and most organizations these days uh, are really looking to try and speed their fulfillment process um, you know the great thing would be if it were possible for us to take in an order and then ship it out instantaneously and there are of course some businesses which can do that kind of thing uh, a great example of that would be the apple or competitors um, app store you know you buy an app and you have it immediately there's no waiting for it to arrive in the mail or waiting for the UPS truck or anything else of that sort the quicker we can get things into the hands of customers the the better off we are in terms of our business processes one of the things that um, is is useful to think about is is there are some products that due to the fact that the product itself is is a digital product uh, we can have instantaneous fulfillment um, this is something that the market is is moving um, towards wherever possible um, there are some things like i just alluded to with the app store which are great illustrations of that but one of the things that a lot of companies are trying to do is trying to figure out a way to take their product which might previously have been something that was delivered in a physical uh, sense and turning it into something that would be digital and therefore could be delivered instantaneously. Uh, some examples of this other than things like apps would be any more um, music, but even beyond that, things like, things like movies. You know, you go back I don't know, maybe a decade and a half, 
and if you wanted to watch a movie in your home, uh, you would have to uh, visit Blockbuster Video and check out at that time, let's see, I'm guessing, let's see, 2000 or so, I don't remember exactly when it was that DVDs became the more popular alternative. But if we go back far enough in time, people would go to places like Blockbuster and get VHS cassette tapes. And then ultimately those were supplanted by DVDs. And then along came Netflix and they had the great idea that we could let people um, you know, select DVDs and we would mail it to them so that they would not have to venture into a physical store. But the problem there, of course, is still it, it takes time for that to happen. And so while there is still that business model out there, uh, a lot of companies want consumers to move towards streaming of movies. And so literally you could go to Amazon Video or you can go to Netflix or numerous other providers at this point and either for free as a part of a membership that you pay or um, for you to purchase, you buy the ability to stream an electronic version of a movie, TV show, or whatever have you, and it shows up instantly. You no longer have to uh, wait for it to be delivered. The business model around this is, is starting to mature, but we still do see some very, very odd things. For example, um, I, I don't know why, but sometimes I, I like to go back and like rewatch old TV shows that were really good. And I just like to, you know, start at episode one and then just like watch through the whole thing. And um, I have done that with a few TV shows. I'm doing that right now with uh, Law and Order. But in the past, I did it a couple years ago. I did it with ER. I don't know, you know, that's probably before some of your time. That might have been something you watched when you were in kindergarten or something. I don't know. But um, I, I hope you're at least familiar with it. I hope I'm not that old at this point. But I started watching uh, ER, and I could go to Amazon, and it, nobody had it for free. Everybody had it. You had to pay for it. I didn't have a problem with that. I was willing to pay for it. But when I went to Amazon, it was like I could. I could get the DVDs for a given season for like $15, or I could buy it electronically for $18. And I just found that incredibly annoying, <laughs> that I had to pay more and I got less, you know, I got nothing to hold in my hands. And, um, you know, I, so, so the cheap side of me wanted to get the physical copy of the discs because I'd saved some money. But the side of me that just finished watching season four and wants to start watching season five now, as opposed to three days from now, often opted for the electronic version. But the really odd thing was like there was just one season that the electronic version was like $30 and the DVDs were 15 So I have one season of ER on disc and the rest <laughs> I have a digital license for. Um, you know, there's still stuff like that that the market is kind of trying to, uh, trying to uh, adjust to and optimize around. We see uh, with books, um, you know, I don't know what you do in regards to your textbooks here at the university, but anymore, you can, in a lot of cases, um, get, buy a physical book. You can rent a physical book. You can buy an electronic book, or you can rent an electronic book. And I've heard students say before that they like the physical book um, because they like to highlight it. I think some students like the physical book because it makes a nice doorstop or something like that, because I don't really know if they ever use the book, but nonetheless, some people really like the physical books and other people are, are okay with the electronic version. I always like physical books until I realized that I could put a whole bunch of electronic books into my iPad and have them with me wherever I went, which was mighty convenient, but there's still something for me about holding a good book in your hand uh, versus the electronic equivalent. But there are an awful lot of companies out there trying to figure out how to make their products digital to reduce this cycle time. And, and if they can't do that, then the other alternative is to try and make 
these steps right here, picking, packing, and sending uh, as quick as, as they possibly can to be reflective of what consumers really are, are, are interested in. There was something else I was going to mention as a part of that, but I can't recall um, what it was. So, oh, I, I'm always reminded of, I think it was IBM ran a commercial. This is years ago, and some of you might have heard me mention this before, but it was like this um, hypothetical future world where next to this guy had a computer on his desk and next to his computer was this big box. It kind of looked vaguely like a printer, but was much larger. And as I recall in the commercial, he goes onto a website and orders scuba gear and presses the checkout button. And immediately the scuba gear comes out of this magical box next to him. Um, you know, we, we don't yet have that. I know a lot of people are saying, oh, you know, we have 3D printing now and things like that, so it's just a matter of time. I don't know. I don't think that's right around the corner quite yet, but uh, there's an awful lot of investment being made in trying to figure out how to take things that we've always thought of as physical products and, and turn them into digital products. One of the best examples of that for those of you that are are, are gamers is the real investment that's made in uh, tying your, you know, your Xbox, your PlayStation, whatever have you, to an online store so that they can entice you not only to buy your games that way, but to buy enhancements to your games that way. Um, businesses are always looking for new and better ways to part you from your money, and they realize that there's some great opportunities there. Any comments or questions about this before we raise your head? Yes, sir. There are several shows that I did that with. Um, yes, I'll just leave it at that without giving you an inventory of my TV watching. <laughs> but uh, yes, I can relate to that too. And, and I will say that when when Lost first came out, I don't know how many of you watched Lost. I, I never watched it until it was pretty much over and then I bought the Blu-rays and watched it. And the only season I watched live was the very last one because there's something very fulfilling about just being able to watch episode after episode and not have to endure the cliffhanger from the week. The problem with that was my wife and I would frequently stay up to like 1 a.m. because we're like, oh, we have to watch the next episode to find out what happens. And um, that didn't always work out real well. <laughs> Other comments, questions? All right, so uh, fulfillment process. Organizational data relevant to fulfillment. Um, the client, okay? No surprise there. I don't know that we could come up with anything that would, where the client wouldn't be relevant because the client is, you know, the root of our organizational hierarchy. It's, it's essentially our organization at its highest level of summary. That's always going to be relevant. Company code. Why, why is company code relevant? for the financial accounting perspective of fulfillment. So that is definitely going to come into play. Now, a new one, bless you, that is, is uh, well, not necessarily new, but unique to fulfillment would be the sales organization, um, the distribution channel, the division, the sales area. We have talked about those already. We'll talk about them a little bit more to fill in some additional information here. But those are all very important organizational data elements in our system that are unique to fulfillment. Uh, we don't have, you know, the concept of distribution channel is irrelevant in purchasing. Uh, it's irrelevant in other contexts, but it's very important to us in the context of fulfillment. Now, we have talked about plants before, and we will talk about plants again. In the context of purchasing, we had plants and storage locations that represent where we put stuff when it came in. Well, in the context of fulfillment, it's the inverse of that. It, we think of it more in terms of where we ship it from. 
in the context of the production process, which is yet to come, the plant is relevant again, but in that one, it's relevant because it's where we make stuff. So it's the same organizational entity, but it takes on kind of different roles in, in different processes here. And then we have the shipping point and credit control area, which are organizational elements as well that are unique to us in the fulfillment process. So we'll talk through these, and uh, that'll probably be the main focus of our time together today, but uh, perhaps we can get into other things after that as well. So we don't need to talk about the client. We don't need to talk about the company code. Sales organization. Sales organization really has a lot in common with the purchasing organization. So it's kind of nice that they both use the word organization as a part of their terminology. We said that a, a sales organization, we said that a purchasing organization is the part of the company that bears the strategic responsibility for buying. Well, similarly, a sales organization bears the ultimate responsibility for for our selling processes. So some of the big things that fall to the sales organization is, you know, they're going to be ultimately responsible for distributing our goods and services. And, and for most organizations, it would be pretty hard for you to come up with a more critical process for us. We live or die based on our ability to effectively sell our products and then get them in the hands of our customers. So this is a very critical role that a sales organization plays. Beyond that, the sales organization has responsibilities in terms of things like pricing and otherwise negotiating sales conditions. And, and we've talked about already in the context of purchasing that prices are inherently flexible and depend on a variety of situations for us to know what prices actually apply. Well, certainly in the context of selling, this is where we have control over that for, for our products. So we can be as simple as we want to be. We can be as sophisticated as we want to be. That all falls to the sales organization, though, for being the, the uh, logical part of our organization that handles this. The sales organization also takes on one additional role that is fairly unique to selling as opposed to buying. One of the things that comes with selling a product to someone is the liability aspect if that product, for example, malfunctions. Um, we see some products in the current news cycle that are having that issue where uh, cell phones are or smartphones are kind of mysteriously just bursting into flames. Well, I'm going to guess that there will be lawsuits filed as a result of that. You know, I don't know if this is the case or not, but it's very likely that someone has gotten injured, perhaps someone's home burned down. You know, I don't know what all has happened or may yet happen, but the liability aspect of that, we have to assign that to some part of our organization and say, okay, you guys are the ones that are responsible for that, and we give that responsibility to the sales organization. Many times when products are sold in the documentation, we have to formally declare things like who to contact in the event you have a legal claim. And so we would publish information about our sales organization, um, contact names, perhaps addresses, certainly phone numbers and things of that sort. So in the grand scheme of, of sales within our organization and in the grand scheme of reporting, the sales organization becomes the highest level of reporting. Now, I want to emphasize that one of the things that we will continue to see as we go along here is the ability that we want to have as an organization to chop up our decision-making and our information tracking 
in a variety of different ways. And so we can do that. And the organizational levels that we will explore here give us the ability to generate all kinds of reports that will let us understand what people are buying, where they're buying it, how they're buying it, and other things of that sort. But when we all roll it up into one fully, you know, one de-aggregated ball, that, or one fully aggregated ball, I should say, the sales organization is what all of that rolls up to. So within, an, within our company, we will need to have at least one sales organization. That is presuming that we actually sell things, which for the most part, if you're a company that's running a product like SAP, ERP, or other, the assumption would be that you are in fact selling things. Um, a company code has to have at least one sales organization. It can have more if it so desires to do so. And so the assignment here is sales organization to, to company code. It is often the case that these sales organizations are based on geography. So we might have a West Coast sales and an East Coast sales. And I'm pretty sure that that is the pattern that you have been following in your lab work as it relates to sales, where you have West Coast versus East Coast. You could easily have broken that into uh, more fine-grained uh, sales organizations, but that would be an example of a very common decision companies make where they just split it in, in that fashion. So that's a sales organization. Comments or questions about that? All right, distribution channel. The idea behind a distribution channel is it is the means through which materials or services reach the customer. But really what that means is we think of this in terms of a distribution strategy or technique. So for example, in your lab work, you have had retail and you have had wholesale as distribution channels. And, and as I trust you understand, perhaps, um, but perhaps not, the distinction here is retail is selling to end consumers, whereas wholesale is, is selling to other businesses. Um, and, and the whole reason why we, we do this is we use it to differentiate things like wholesale versus retail versus internet um, versus catalog. We could even have uh, infomercial as a distribution channel. Um, we could have phone sales if customers actually call us up and place orders. Um, you know, any way that we, any strategy that we employ for getting people to buy our products, we could use a distribution channel to characterize that particular strategy. Now, why do we do this? Uh, it's important for us to realize here the why of all of this. What distribution channels give us the ability to do is, first of all, we can differentiate pricing if we use different distribution channels. So if we want to sell at one pricing scheme to retail customers and a different pricing scheme to wholesale customers, designating them as different distribution channels gives us a way to do that. In ERP SIM, you had a distribution channel that was hypermarkets, you had a distribution channel that was grocery stores, and you had a distribution channel that was independent grocers or convenience stores. So obviously that's reflective of the kinds of products and the strategies used by your organization. You didn't have internet sales, but you could have, hypothetically. If that were a real company and you thought that you could sell muesli online, you could do things in that fashion. You did not have wholesale, or, or really all of your sales were wholesale. You didn't actually sell individual boxes to end customers. So the decision here of what distribution channels we need, how many do we need, is more of a strategic decision and a way for us to allocate responsibilities in our company and say, you know, Kelly, you're in charge of, 
of the retail distribution channel and, and Joe, you're in charge of internet and it gives us a way of tasking people with responsibilities. It also gives us a way of tracking statistics. And so that's a very important element of this. Let me go back to pricing, for example. This was an area, particularly in the early days of internet sales, that caused a lot of confusion on the part of customers and a lot of challenges for retailers that you still see today. I don't know if you've ever experienced this before, but um, a couple of months ago, I was looking online to purchase a, a new television that I needed, and I went on to the Best Buy website and was just kind of looking at the different products, and I found a product that they had listed as their deal of the day. It was actually Amazon Prime Day, and I think Best Buy was marking down some things to try and compete with Amazon, and they had a TV that was normally $999 that they had marked down to $499. Well, I went to the Best Buy store here in town uh, to look at it and perhaps to purchase it. And when I walked in, I, I went with my wife and I said, okay, you know, there's a whole bunch of TVs here. I said, look for the one that was, I forget the name brand. So I'd say, look for the Samsung that's $499. And we walked around and walked around and walked around never found the Samsung that was $499. So I pulled out my phone and I found the ad on bestbuy.com and I found the model number and then we walked around and found that model number and the, the TV that was $499 online, regularly priced $999, was on sale in the store for $899. And I called the salesperson over and I said, is this this particular TV? And he's like, oh yeah, this is a great TV. And he starts the process of selling me the TV. And I'm like, okay, you don't have to sell me on the TV. I know I want it, but your website says it's $4.99. He's like, there's no way that TV's $4.99. That's like one of our best sellers. That's, you know. And I, was like, I handed him my phone, I'm like, look. And he's like, huh, okay. And he walks away and then comes back and, and says, okay, go over to customer service and show them your phone and they'll sell it to you for $4.99. And so they priced matched uh, their, their online sale. Well, you know, a lot of customers would just automatically assume, well, the prices online are the same as the prices in the store. Not necessarily. Sometimes the prices online are cheaper, sometimes they're more expensive, and retailers have had to come up with a strategy to figure out how to manage that. When Walmart first started selling online, it was fairly early in the days of e-commerce and customers hadn't really figured out how things worked yet and it caused all kinds of problems because uh, some products were cheaper online and customers would go to the store and demand to get it at a cheaper price and then sometimes it was more expensive online or it was cheaper it was more expensive online and so they tried to get the online store to price match the physical store and it just caused a big headache and I'm pretty sure that Walmart adopted the same strategy as Best Buy and a lot of other companies where they said it's going to be the same price everywhere. We don't have to do it that way. If we want to distinguish prices between different methods of distribution, distribution channels give us a, a way of doing that. Now, as far as the logistics of this, a sales organization has to have at least one distribution channel. But this is now something that I don't know that we've ever seen before. Uh, certainly, we haven't seen it in the context of sales um, until this point in our discussion, at least. But the same distribution channel can exist for multiple sales organizations. So we might have as one of our distribution channels internet sales. Well, the West Coast could sell on the internet and the East Coast could sell on the internet. Uh, the idea here is if a given sales organization is authorized to sell using that channel, then we have to configure the system accordingly. It could well be that we decide that only the West Coast can do wholesale. Our East Coast operators don't have the ability to do, to do a wholesale. It could be that we have a huge catalog sales operation and the East Coast manages all of the catalog sales. And so only the East Coast sales organization 
has that distribution channel available to it. The other odd thing about distribution channels from a configuration point of view is we actually create distribution channels at the client level, but then assign them to sales organizations. So one of the things that, that you might have noted in your lab work this semester is you created your plants and you created a lot of different things, but you didn't actually create your distribution channels. You, you just used existing distribution channels and assigned them to your, to your sales organization. That's because it wouldn't work for each of you to create your own because they exist at that kind of universal client level. And so we make them once. I made them once, and then all of you, you use them throughout your lab work. So distribution channel, questions? Okay, rolling right along. Division. A division gives us a way to group up our materials and organize them, once again, for sake of keeping track of things. And we will typically do this uh, thinking in terms of product lines. So we take products that have some kind of um, relationship with one another, and we organize them into divisions. So, you know, this is going to depend on, um, you know, what kind of business we are. If we're a manufacturer, let's say we're a, um, I don't know, I usually use vehicles as an example of this, but let's do something different. Let's assume that I'm a, um, I just lost the word, what's it called? Oh, a pharmaceutical company. So we're a pharmaceutical company, and, and we might make, um, you know, we might keep it real simple. And we have an over-the-counter division, and we have a, I was going to say subscription, but that's not the right word, a, a prescription uh, division. And we might choose to organize things in that fashion. Or we could get a little bit more uh, sophisticated. We could say, okay, we're going to have a, and I don't really know what these all are, but we could have like a, an analgesic division, and we could have a decongestant division. I don't think there's a J in decongestant. Um, I don't know. Um, we could have a, um, what's, this, what's that? Yeah, I was going to say, I was, I was trying to figure out what would be the word to use there, but, uh, you know, something for, uh, like, narcotic-type products. You know, we could break it up that way if we were so inclined. It's kind of up to us. It depends on how big our company is. It depends on how we perhaps segregate things related to production and certainly how we sell things. So we can break things up according to division. Once again, this gives us a way to differentiate pricing, to differentiate responsibilities, to track statistics, and to track plans. So think of it this way. We sell analgesics, so we want to keep track of our sales of analgesics, but we might sell analgesics online. So we want to keep track of not only the fact that we sold an analgesic, but that we sold it online. So this is why we have the ability to designate distribution channels, we designate divisions, because it kind of gives us different ways to keep track of statistics and to organize our company. So in a way, if we were talking about the pricing of analgesics online, well, the head of the analgesics division has some say in that, as does the person in charge of the internet sales distribution channel. So it kind of gives us a way to carve out responsibilities here. Yes, sir. You know, the, the after part is not really hard. I mean, it, it, from a configuration perspective, you go in, you create a new division, and you just change the assignment of things. The more challenging part tends to be if you then want to go back and recast what happened in the past in terms of your new definitions for the sake of, like, tracking things over time. 
You know, whenever you change something at any given point in time, that's where it becomes problematic, you know. And so a lot of times companies will say, you know, we, we reorganized in 2012. So, you know, you look at reports and they always like, don't ever go back further than 2012 because it's hard to rationalize it all the same. From a, from a technical point of view, it's not very hard at all. And, and as an aside, as companies get more and more into things like analytics, stuff like this becomes very, very important because it gives us different ways to aggregate things. But as we increase in our sophistication and tracking things, some of this over time may become less important, you know, because we're not far away from the day when, you know, this marker will have an embedded RFID tag and somebody sitting in an office somewhere could say, gee, I wonder where that black magic marker that was made, you know, on Tuesday such and such a date and has this particular ID on it is, and they could know, you know, like exactly what Staples store this was sold to and so on. Um, more and more, we're getting sophisticated in our tracking, and, and so some of this is kind of the, the legacy way of gathering statistics without getting into that level of detail. I think somebody over here had a comment or something. No? Oh. I was just wondering, your uh, example of the pharmaceutical, I know they have to do uh, federal reporting about how many of the controls that they can change their sold and whatnot. Would this also be where they pull the reports from? Or the information from them? I think that that would probably fall to the sales organization because of the of the product liability perspective. So I, I'm thinking that we probably would park that there, but I, I certainly can't dogmatically say that every company is gonna do that in that fashion. Uh, the division could play a very major role in that because sure, if this were a real world scenario, the, the person in charge of the controlled substances um, it is going to have a lot more reporting overhead than the guy who's in charge of like the heartburn medicine. So, so yeah, you do have that dimension that, that comes into play. And it could be the division that handles it on that level. Um, I don't know. I, yep, I don't think we covered this. Yes, sir. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, hang on. It probably could, but it would probably exist under a different material number. Um, distribution channel, the same material can be sold by any number of distribution channels. Um, but when it comes to divisions, you know, you're, you're talking about in this example, could a product be both an analgesic and a decongestant? Um, I would suspect that one of two things would happen. Either the company would decide, okay, that product belongs as an analgesic, and it puts it there. Or if the company said, well, no, we want to sell it as analgesic, and we want to sell it as a decongestant, they might actually you know, put two different kinds of labels on it, put it in different boxes, and, and then it would be the same product, but it would actually be sold by the different divisions under, under a different name. And the pharmaceutical industry happens to be a good example of that. There's been a lot of products over the years that were invented for one reason and then came to market for different reasons. You know, they were thought, oh, this would be a good product for, you know, blood pressure, and it turns out that it actually helps people grow hair or something like that. And so you could have uh, something like that. Um, so I, I think that's the way it would play out. The example I typically use would be in vehicle manufacturing. You don't usually have something that's a car and a truck. But if you had like a vehicle that was half car, half truck, like what was the old one? The, was it an El Camino that was like a car with a truck bed on the back? You know, probably somebody would fight over not wanting it. No, no, you take that. I don't know. But, you know, the, the divisions probably would decide who that belongs to as opposed to it being as opposed to it being both of them. 
So I put this up. The sales organization has to have at least one division. Uh, division can exist in multiple sales organizations. Uh, division is created at the client level, but assigned at the, the sales, but assigned to uh, a sales organization. So this brings us back to what, what we have seen before, which is the concept of a sales area. And a sales area is just a valid combination of a sales organization, a distribution channel, and a division. So this right here, this, this diagram illustrates, you know, here's the company code, company code 100, and we'll assume that S100 is, is West Coast and S200 is, is the East Coast. And this diagram illustrates that, okay, the West Coast can sell retail toys. So we have this circle right here, which is a valid sales area. And then you'll notice here, uh, the West Coast can on the internet sell toys because that's a valid sales area. And then um, that's the only two ways we sell toys. Games, you'll notice that games can be sold retail and internet. And so there's two more sales areas there. But clothes, you'll notice clothes, we sell retail and wholesale. So if this diagram were reflective truly of reality, what we're seeing here is that we don't sell clothes on the internet, we don't wholesale games, and we don't wholesale toys. At least when I say we, that means we in terms of the West Coast sales organization. If we go over to the East Coast, they sell toys, but they can only retail toys. And they sell games, they can retail and wholesale games. So you'll notice the East Coast is authorized to sell games at wholesale, but the West Coast doesn't have that pathway. They are not authorized to do so based on the way we want to organize our company. And so that's what sales areas do for us. It gives us the ability to, to take a sales organization, take a distribution channel, take a division, and say, yes, this makes sense. This is how we want to do things. Now, what is very, very common here would be, like you see here, the internet sales is just associated with, with one sales organization. And so all of our internet sales are going to bubble up through that uh, West Coast sales organization, and the people here on the East Coast don't have any ability to, to do that. They can only do traditional retail and wholesale. What we're actually seeing here is this is, if you count the lines here, and it gets messy for me to draw the picture, but there are nine different um, sales areas here. And you can tell that most easily by just looking at the bottom level here. We have two lines that go into this. We have two lines that go into this. We have two lines that go into this. We have one here and we have two here. So there's actually nine different sales areas that are, are represented here. And, and you know, I won't pop up the SAP GUI and show you this, you know that when you put in a sales order, you have to tag it with this information. Every sales order has to be tagged with a sales area, and something tells me we'll mention that again before our discussion is, is done here. Okay, so moving along. Delivering plan. Since a company code may have many sales organizations, a plant may fulfill orders from multiple sales organizations and multiple distribution channels. Remember, we had observed previously that a plant is assigned to a company code. So that's still the case. That's always our rule here. But, you know, we need to ship things out to customers. We have products that we need to get into people's hands. So we could have a plant that ships out orders that came in over the internet, ships in orders that came in by way of the catalog, doesn't matter what distribution channel it came in, they ship out those products. So the, the plant can cross over between sales organizations and, and distribution channels. In the context of, of manufacturing, a plant is where goods are produced. 
In the context of sales and distribution, a plant is where goods and services are distributed or rendered. So if you think of it this way, Walmart doesn't actually make things. They don't really engage in manufacturing themselves. They might contract a manufacturer to make things for them, but Walmart does not operate manufacturing plants. But they do have plants that really we would more commonly call distribution centers or warehouses because that's where they're storing things and that's where they're distributing things. And Walmart is a great example of this. We're seeing this with other um, retail chains as well. The strategy of how they move into an area is often based on how they do their distribution centers. Um, I don't know how many of you do a lot of grocery shopping, typically university students don't do a whole ton of grocery shopping, but uh, you, once you graduate, will probably do more of that. And I know that when we moved to this area, my wife greatly lamented the quantity and quality of grocery stores in this area. I don't know your experience. I don't know if any of you work for a grocery store. Please do not be insulted, but we very much miss Publix. And we would like for there to be a Publix in Johnson City. Well, we don't have one, but one is coming. And the reason why we know one is coming is because there's a Publix being built in Greenville, Tennessee, and in Bristol, Virginia. Well, what companies like Publix do is if we could imagine, you know, a, a map here of, I don't know what this is, but clearly not the state of Tennessee, some <laughs> asteroid somewhere it looks like. But, you know, the idea is here's our distribution center, and, and so we, we build stores that can be reasonably served by this distribution center because they're, you know, a reasonable uh, distance away for us to drive a truck back and forth maybe every other day. Well, when we're ready to move into another area, we pop up another distribution center and then we build stores around that distribution center and then we want to move into another area. We, you first build the distribution center and, and then you build the stores that are served by that distribution center. Well, Publix is obviously uh, already or is getting ready to put a distribution center in this region, otherwise they wouldn't be able to service those stores in Bristol and Greenville. So I would imagine that by 2020, um, we'll have Publix in the Tri-Cities area. And some of the newspapers that I've read uh, are kind of reporting that similarly as well. So in the context of retail, you know, we may not have plants that actually have smokestacks and equipment that make things, but we have these distribution channels that serve, at, or excuse me, we have these plants that serve as, as distribution centers that are a key element in our delivering products. There's some really interesting things that are being experimented with right now that kind of parallel this but are not the same. Have any of you been to an Amazon store? Anybody been in one? It's the weirdest thing. Um, Amazon uh, decided a couple years ago that it might make sense for them to build stores. And so they're, they're putting up these small stores that have just like the most popular products that Amazon sells and you can go in and buy it from that store. And so whereas Amazon, you know, ran Barnes and Noble practically out of business and they ran, what was it, they ran Borders out of business. Now they're getting into the store business themselves. So why do they do that? Well, it's all about just another way of getting their products into the hands of their customers. And so they're kind of looking at this idea of, of putting plants, if you will, to service their physical stores as a way of getting products into customers' hands, hands quicker. Shipping point. This is a new concept for us, I think. A shipping point is a physical location from which outbound deliveries are sent. This could be a loading dock. It could be a mail room. It could be a rail depot. It could be a group of employees. 
that handle uh, expedited orders. So imagine, if you will, this right here is, is our factory. And if we look at it from like satellite view, there's a fence around our factory to keep people out. Well, we ship stuff out of this factory. And on the back of this factory, maybe there's five loading docks. Well, those would be shipping points. And we might have different kinds of trucks that can go to different of those loading docks because of the configuration of the ramp and so on. So some of the stuff gets shipped out by way of the loading dock. But we also have a place where customers can actually drive up to our plant and, and pick up items and just carry them back to their car or carry them back to their truck or whatever have you. So we, we have another little door over here with a little depot, if you will, that people could go in and pick stuff up. That would be another shipping point. We might also have just a desk inside of the building here that when someone orders something for overnight delivery, we take stuff from the plant and we carry it to those people and they contact FedEx or UPS or whoever and they specially handle overnight deliveries for us. And then, because our plant appears to be incredibly sophisticated, um, there's train tracks that run through our property and we actually have a, a train depot and we can send stuff out by way of rail car and so that's a, another shipping point for us. So the shipping point is the actual place where things go to actually leave our, our possession. Now we have to have at least one shipping point. We can have many and these shipping points are assigned to a given plant. So in this example right here, I've only drawn one plant in my diagram. And so all of this exists in the context of that plant. And notice in my picture, some of these are actually in the plant building, but some of it is buildings that are adjacent to it, or even just kind of logical locations like somebody's desk that's hardly an elaborate physical setup. What is also unique about shipping points is the same shipping point can be assigned to many plants. So maybe because our company is expanding, we build another plant on the same property. And so now we have plant two. And plant two has its own unique loading docks that would be shipping points, but it also uses this rail yard over here. So that rail depot is used by both plant one and plant two. There's no problem with that. The same shipping point can be assigned to many plants. So every plant has to have at least one, but they can kind of cross over. Yes, sir. No, no. The idea there is it would probably be, we would think of it in terms of there's like a logical location where we accumulate things in a truck and then send it there. Um, you know, it, it could be something as simple as uh, we, we have these five loading docks and we know that loading dock one is always going to be a truck that drives back and forth between the post office. So we think of that as the post office shipping point, um, but it's really just a logical designation of that. So yeah, however we want to do that, we, we can do that. Um, this, is, this is kind of the book's illustration of this. Um, there's a shipping point here that exists in a particular storage facility in a particular plant. And then there's the front office. And then there's another storage facility in another plant. Or another, yeah, so I think this is kind of like the same as I did an overhead view. And so we only have one shipping point. And so everything that we ship out, 
goes goes over here, which seems like it'd be really inconvenient, but we'll assume you know we load stuff up on a forklift or whatever and we drive it over here and it gets loaded there. So that would be a shared shipping point. And and there's nothing that says that we can't, you know, have a variety of things. We have two uh, normal shipping points and then we have an express shipping point and we just kind of designate things here. So these shipping points are going to have to go on to our shipping documentation for us to know how to make things get where they're supposed to go, but they can be shared within our organization for the sake of, of logistics. Any questions about that? Okay, this next thing, I want to talk about not only the configuration elements of this, but I think even more important, the, the role that this plays in our organization from a strategic perspective. Credit control area. Credit control area is the part of our company that is responsible for granting and managing customer credit. It helps the company manage risk and credit exposure. There is a company that as far as I know still exists, but I'm guessing that it's likely that none of you have ever bought from them. Although they were one of the first internet retailers, uh, they predated internet sales with catalog sales. And they actually were a company that did a lot of business despite the fact that, that a lot of people didn't think too highly of the company. And, and I'm talking about a company called Finger Hut. How many of you have ever even heard of Finger Hut? Oh, okay. How many of you ever bought from Finger Hut? Okay, some of you. So I'm, I'm actually surprised that, that a lot of you have heard of them. Finger Hut came to fame based on their policy of we will give anybody credit, okay? If you were like a high school student who just got your first job, you know, and you wanted a credit card, most banks or credit card companies wouldn't give you a credit card because you wouldn't have a credit history. But Fingerhut would. I mean, Fingerhut practically, if you send in an application for your dog, they probably would give it a credit card because their policy was we give credit to everybody. Well, they did that on purpose. They did it because they realized if we give people credit like this, we can sell them stuff. And so they made the focus of their business giving people credit freely and then using that to get them to buy the stuff that they sell. Now, of course, because they realized that a lot of people that they give credit cards to would wind up not paying them, they charged a really, really, really high credit uh, interest rate. But their strategy as a company was based on being very, very liberal at granting credit. Some companies go to the other extreme and it's very, very hard to get them to extend credit. And so the same kinds of things that companies look at when they're granting individuals credit lines, like how much money do they make, how likely do they think they were going, they're going to be to pay us back? What's their history in payments with other companies? That exists on the business level as well. And so if I own a company and I want to do business with Dell and I want Dell to sell to me on credit, they'll make me fill out an application for my company and they'll give me a line of credit that might say you can order up to $50,000 worth of computer equipment and we will give you, you know, maybe 30 days to pay or we'll even let you take longer than that to pay as long as you pay us interest. But anytime we sell to a customer and don't require them to pay up front, we're granting them credit. So realize that, you know, if you think of credit in terms of I can buy something and take 12 months to pay for it, that could be the case, but what's more typically here is we're thinking about just the ability to ship out a customer's order without taking cash up front, 
and then giving them perhaps just 30 days to pay, and then after that, there, there being penalties. Well, the different ways this could play out, we could have one credit control area that manages all of our company codes. And so all customers in all of our company codes are managed by one credit control area. Now, why would we want to do that? What's the merit of that? Let me, I think the next slide is blank here. Okay, so, so here's an example. I have company code one, company code two, and company code three. And, and here's customer. So this is customer one, which wants to buy. So customer one wants to buy from company code three. They've never bought from them before. So they have to get an account set up. When they get an account set up, as part of the setup process, they'll be granted a line of credit. We'll talk more about that in a moment. But let's assume, for the sake of argument here, that the credit control area examines customer one and says they are worthy of a $100,000 credit line. Now, what that means is because we operate centrally, is that credit line is actually good at all three of these company codes. And more importantly, it is shared across all three company codes. So if I contact company code one and I order $35,000 worth of stuff, I have $65,000 left to spend, if you will. And so I contact company code number two and I place a $50,000 order and that goes through because I'm under my credit line. I contact company code number one and I try and order $30,000 worth of stuff and now I have a problem because now I have gone above my credit limit. But my credit limit is pooled across all of these company codes because I do centralized credit control. Now, what's the advantage to a company of centralized credit control? There are several. What, what's, the, what's the pros of this from the, from the seller's perspective? Okay, and, and we're looking at this communally. I'm gonna kind of expand that. See, look at it this way. Suppose we didn't handle it in this fashion and we let every company code make its own decision, okay? So on Monday of this week, customer one contacts every one of these companies independently. And every one of these companies look at this customer and say, yeah, we think based on the assets that that company has, we'll give them a $100,000 line of credit. And so on Tuesday, every one of these companies email back the customer and say, congratulations, you have a $100,000 line of credit. And then on Wednesday, the customer buys $100,000 worth of stuff from every one of those three different companies. So we had a customer that when we looked at, we thought that customer was worthy of us giving them $100,000 worth of credit, but we actually just sold them $300,000 worth of stuff because every one of those company codes is independent. Now, you might not think this is that big a deal, but a lot of businesses go out of business. And depending upon the industry you're in, this can be a huge risk. I know that for a long time, and I, I think this statistic is still true, that in the restaurant business, over half of restaurants go out of business in their first year of operation. And of those that make it to year two, half of those will go out of business in year two. I mean, your odds of starting a new successful restaurant 
are perhaps not as high as your odds of winning the lottery, but the odds are against you being successful. So if my company is very, very liberal and granting credit, it's very likely that companies are going to go out of business owing us money, which is very, very bad. So if you're the credit manager, you have a very challenging job. Because first of all, if a company is a good company and you assign them too low a credit limit, they may take their business elsewhere. And you don't want that to happen. But on the other hand, if a company is not a good credit risk and you give them too high a credit limit, you may wind up never getting paid for stuff. So that's why you really want to hit that sweet spot of not too high and not too low. You want it to be just right. Well, if we're doing this in a, de in a centralized fashion, from a seller's perspective, we can, um, we can mitigate risk. Because we can, if we can look at a customer, we can give them the highest credit line that we think that they are worthy of and realize that that same credit line is going to span across all facets of our operation. From the buyer's perspective, the nice thing about a consolidated or a centralized credit system is once I have credit with one, I have credit with all. So uh, if you will, I have universal credit. This is kind of like the uh, business equivalent of you can buy at more places with a Visa card than you can with a Belk card, okay? So we're granting credit to a company across all of our company codes. From the seller's perspective, another positive here is, is that I, I, I minimize my workload. You know, I may actually have to pull documents actually have a human being look at this and make a decision about the credit limits assigned to a customer. Um, if I'm doing this in the manner I'm describing here, I have one office that's probably handling this uh, across my entire enterprise. That's, that's really, really good. The other strategic alternative I have is decentralized credit. Now in decentralized credit, I have more than one credit control area in the enterprise. So typically that's going to mean is that I'm going to have a different credit control area for every company code. Or at least I'm going to have some that are independent and some that are perhaps are consolidated. And, and so it's, it's more of an individualistic perspective. And so I'll come back to this, but so the idea here would be instead of my drawing a circle, around this, um, what I have is, is uh, every one of these company codes does their own credit granting. So the circle goes away. And so now company code one might say customer one is worthy of a 70,000 line of credit. Here it's 100,000 and, and here it's 90,000. Well, you know, we have to evaluate that and then every one of those companies um, has to manage the credit line independently, which is the nice thing about this is the independent one from the seller's perspective, um, you know, it, it gives me perhaps the ability to maximize my sales because I don't have to worry about what the customer has as far as their obligation to other companies. And, and, but the, from the buyer's perspective, uh, perhaps more credit, but uh, from the seller's perspective, uh, more risk, and, and uh, from the buyer's perspective, uh, if you will, more, more work slash time because I've got established credit with every one of these companies independently. I don't know if you've ever thought about it before, but credit is actually a huge part of our economy in this country. And if credit went away, 
a lot of the things that you and I enjoy today would, would cease to exist. Uh, the best example I can give you of that is, imagine if we went back in time and tried to start the whole e-commerce boom again without anybody having credit cards. And so you could go to a website and place an order, but then you'd have to mail them a check before they'd ship you the stuff. I mean, that would kind of do away with the whole benefit of buying online for the most part. So you couldn't really have e-commerce without having credit. Well, if we look at business, if every business was required to pay cash up front, a lot of businesses just couldn't exist. So this idea of this granting of credit and this managing credit is a huge part of the success of our organization. Companies will engage in what they call making uh, allowance, um, which only has one E, uh, allowance for bad debt. And here's an ironic thing. Let's assume that you were in charge of setting credit limits for company code one, okay? And let's assume that last year, we as a company sold $100 million worth of stuff. And at the end of the year, our allowance for bad debts, meaning the customers that defaulted, let's assume that that was $0. What does that tell you? Yeah we probably have too strict a credit because this tells me that every one of our customers are able to pay us, which that's good, but we expect some customers not to be able to pay us. So if we actually have this situation right here, then, then we're probably being too strict. Now, if we're selling $100 million a year worth of stuff and, and we have bad debt of $10 million, well, we're being way too liberal in granting credit. You know, there, there's way too much going on there. Too many people are defaulting. But it's kind of a balance once again. If, if we never uh, have anybody default, then we're probably giving people too low a credit line or turning people away that would be worth our taking a risk on. So there's a balance here. There's a huge uh, amount of strategic implications for an organization and how they, they manage these decisions. Because many times you'll have a customer that they could buy, and let's assume it's customer one here, but, but here's my company, and then here's company A and company B that are competitors. Well, we all sell similar products. And the customer decides that he wants to shop with me and, and he wants to place a $100,000 order. But when he comes, I tell him, I'm only prepared to give you a $50,000 credit line, so you're going to pay $50,000 up front. Well, in that case, the customer, they might decide to do that, or they might say, hey, company A has a product that's pretty similar. Now, granted, it costs us 1% more, but they're prepared to give us a $100,000 credit line. So I'm going to buy from company A. So those kinds of decisions take place all the time. That's why we have to be very careful as a company in how we grant credit. Going back to where I started here, Finger Hut was not a successful business because people loved their products. Finger Hut was a successful business because they gave credit to people. And they trusted that most people would pay it back. <coughs> And they were prepared for people that didn't pay it back. They just kind of factored that in as part of the price of doing business. Now, getting back to more of the configuration in our ERP perspective, what we see in the system is something called a credit management master record. And what a credit management master record does is it extends our existing customer master record but for credit-related activities. So I realize that our focus at this point is on organizational data, but that's the master data here that drives it. The credit control area is going to be adding things to 
this credit management master record and using that as the place where their credit decisions are actually reflected. Yes, sir. Roger. It depends on our strategy. If we're centralized, we're going to grant the customer credit across all our entities, and the customer may not even know that. You know, it may well be that the customer picks up the phone one day, calls a, another company that they've never done business with before, and says, I'd like to open an account and establish a credit line, and the clerk types their information, looks in the system, and sees they already have an account based on them having done business with one of our partners. And so at that point, they can copy things like the company address and things like that, and then leverage the existing credit management master and basically say, oh, you didn't know this, but we're also affiliated with such and such a company, and so you already have a credit line with us. But yeah, they might not have ever been told. Now, they fill out paperwork that has tons and tons of little tiny print in it, and it could well be that our lawyer told us to put in there how this works. But I don't know that we would even have to tell them this. This is kind of just our own internal record keeping that, that they don't really need to know about necessarily. Other questions about this? All right, well, this is a great place for us to stop for the day.